lovely Empire listeners. I am so excited to tell you a thing and so is William excited to tell you a thing. Tickets for our live show are now on sale. They absolutely are. And we will be taking to the stage at the Barbican in London on the evening of Monday, the 8th of July. Yes, I know you've got a lot to top, my friend, because if you didn't uh, <laughs> didn't come along to the last live show, well, there were men in tabards ripping out their hair because William broke every rule in the book and climbed into the pulpit of our very grand venue. Uninvited. <laughs> Uninvited. <laughs> I had such fun. It was actually magnificent. It was such a laugh. What was surprising, though, is how quickly the tickets sold out. We couldn't believe our eyes, actually. So um, do get your tickets early. And as for the, the subject of the show, it's a secret, but we can promise lots of history, lots of answers to your fantastic questions. Do please come and join us to buy your tickets now. Follow the link in the description of our most recent episode. Go to the Empire Pod Twitter feed at Empire Pod UK or just Google Empire Live at the Barbican. And we look forward to seeing you because we're always intrigued to know who it is listening to us as they walk their dogs and doing their ironing and doing the washing up. Yeah, so put down the dog, put down the ironing, back away from the housework. Don't put the ironing on the dog. No, that would be a terrible thing. (laughs) Although there was a hot dog gag in there somewhere. Anyway, look, the show is on the evening of Monday, the 8th of July at the Barbican in London. See you all in July. We can't wait. Welcome to Empire with me, Anita Arnon. And me, William Drumple. Now, as part of our great Empresses season, which is going down so well with all of you, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be discussing Nur Jahan, the great Mughal Empress of the 17th century, wife of the Emperor Jahangir. And boy, what a story this is, William. You love it. This is one of my favourite stories. I've obviously written about the Mughals for many years now, and this is one of the most extraordinary stories in that whole extraordinary tale. And it features, as so often in this series, an extraordinary woman who rises from very unpromising background to have amazing amount of power in a period of history when you imagine uh, that women are not powerful in the part of the world where you would imagine women not to be powerful. There's a very strong idea out there that uh, in the Islamic world, women are oppressed if they're in royal palaces, they're in harems, they're sexual objects, they're part of a sort of conveyor belt of possible sexual pleasures for the ruler. The reality of the history, however, is completely different. The Mughal history shows that women were extraordinarily powerful. And usually the power rests with the elderly grandmothers and the matrons at the back of the Zanana who are pulling all the strings and either plotting wars or reconciling warring nephews and grandchildren. But what's so extraordinary about the story of Nur Jahan, who we're talking about today, is that she is a woman at the height of her powers, at the height of her sexuality, and yet she becomes effectively the ruler of the richest and most productive land in the world. In the 17th century, Mughal India is producing about a third of the world's GDP. It's an extraordinarily industrious, well-ordered, peaceful, and rich society. And at the heart of it is this extraordinary woman, Noor Jahan. Let's unpack a little bit of why this is so extraordinary. So I think you're starting in the 17th century, but can we just have a brief look back over our shoulder at the late 16th century and, and the man who almost sets the tone and atmosphere of what comes next for, for Noor Jahan and with Noor Jahan. And we're talking about Emperor Akbar. Now, if you've been brought up in the Indian tradition and, you know, Punjabis particularly, we, you know, in hymns, he often comes up in sort of these Hindu songs of devotion. So there is there is one in particular where there's a, a pilgrimage that goes up a mountain just on the border of Kashmir. And it is called Vaishnu Devi. It's a, the pilgrimage of the mother. And there is a, a hymn that people sing on the way up. And it has a, a line in it, Nangi Peri Akbaraya, which is like, you know, even Akbar came barefoot to walk up this mountain in supplication, right? So, I mean, I think the story goes that he wanted a son and he was desperate for a son, so he did this pilgrimage. And the image that's conjured is of a man who, if not secular, has an interest and openness to other religions in India. Is that that the case? 
Yes, I mean, I, I wouldn't use the word secular, definitely not, because it wasn't that he was excluding religion from his kingdom or, or, or running it outside the religious context. On the contrary, he was absolutely fascinated by religion. But what is surprising, improbable, and interesting is that he operated always on the grounds of reason. He said he wanted to bring different religious traditions together in dialogue so that he could distinguish the marshy land of tradition from the firm land of reason. And he wanted to see how these different religions operated independently of each other, what their basis for their claims were. And he wanted to examine this in a rational, reasonable, and intelligent manner. Uh, and he would not just rely on ideas of divine revelation. He wanted people to demonstrate why their religious tradition was worthwhile and what the basis of its authority was. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a, that sort of show, don't tell kind of <laughs> sort of <laughs> school of thought. But also, I'm really interested in art during his time as well, Akbar's time uh, as emperor, because it is the commonly held belief that Islam is so austere, it will deal with calligraphy and the written word, but it doesn't like depictions, certainly of the human form, but even of, you know, living, breathing creatures. And yet, during Akbar's time, you have the most enormous strides in art and painting and sculpture. Well, I think you have to be very careful about this idea that Islam doesn't do the natural world or only does calligraphy and so on, because there are so many exceptions to that rule. From the very beginning in, in the Umayyad Caliphate, at the very first years of Islam, you have these private palaces of the Umayyads in Jordan and in Jericho, which have not only human figures, but naked human figures. And throughout the different Arab and Persianate sultanates, you get frequent images of human beings. But it's under Akbar that this really takes off in Mughal India. And he mixes ideas from Persia. He brings in Persian artists, mixes it with artists trained in various Indian traditions, such as the Jain traditions of Gujarat, and begins the whole world of, uh, of Mughal art, which will grow to be one of the great moments in, in, in world civilization. I mean, the, the gorgeous Mughal miniature tradition contains some of the most beautifully observed, most sensitive paintings ever produced. I like his justification. You know, it's the qualification of this, that, you know, what he is doing is not wrong by allowing this art to flourish. He says, there are many that hate painting, but such men I dislike. It appears to me as if a painter had quite a peculiar means of recognizing God. For a painter, in sketching anything that has life and in devising its limbs, one after the other, must come to feel that he cannot bestow individuality upon his work and is thus forced to think of God, the giver of life. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful defense of doing what man can do best, really, which is sort of, you know, to worship what is around him. And what's so wonderful about Akbar is that in almost every way he defies stereotypes of, of, of what many Western people think Islamic rulers are like. So, for example, we mentioned earlier this business of the harem. Akbar did have over 300 partners or wives in his Zanana, according to one estimate, but they were married for diplomatic connections. And both Akbar and Jahangir and Shah Jahan, the next generation, all practice extraordinary sexual restraint, and they are notably uxorious. Jahangir, as we're going to hear in this pod and the one that follows, was obsessed with his wife, Nur Jahan. And uh, the same is true of uh, Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal. They're two, two of the great, mm. most successful marriages in Indian or Islamic history. So while these stereotypes of sort of, you know, sexual bonanzas continue to have a half-life in, in, in films and so on, the historic reality is actually very different. And the same is true of, the, of religious tolerance. Over and over again, we have these ideas that Islam crushes dissent, does not allow exploration of ideas that are contrary to the Quran. But at a city called Fatipur Sikri, which Akbar creates, he creates effectively a laboratory of religion where he brings together Sunni, Shia, Sufi, Vaishnav, Shaivite, Jain, Jewish, Portuguese friars from Goa, all these different sorts of uh, religious traditions are brought together to be discussed in, in this sort of multi-faith cosmopolitan arena. It's the most extraordinary moment in history. And this at the same time when in England, Jesuits are being hung, drawn and quartered in the Tiber. 
uh, and hunted down in priest holes in, in, in their posh houses in Yorkshire or pulled apart in, and, and burnt at the stake in York. Yeah, no, I mean, that's an incredibly sobering thought. So to Noor Jahan now, who is not a product of this um, cosmopolitan, artistically colourful and rich uh, city of Fatabur Sikri, the Mughal capital, her parents are believed to come from Herat, which at the time was part of the Persian Empire, and were descended from noble families. Tell us a little bit more about where she comes from. What's her origin story? Well, one of the great cliches of Mughal India, because it was Persian-speaking but was not a native Persian-speaking country, is that Persians coming into India at this time, this very rich country with many opportunities, often find that they can skip hierarchies. The story was that even a salt seller can pass himself off as an Omra, as a great nobleman of the court. And the suspicion is that Nur Jahan's father, Gias, who was 22 at the time of, of Nur's birth, was himself from a, you know, a relatively modest service background. He had to flee Safavid Persia when he may have fallen into debt or was out of favor with the Safavid court and uh, had to escape the attention of the Safavid police. And uh, he set off on the road from Kandahar towards Agra looking for service, as many of his Persian contemporaries did. And India offered Persians a kind of safe haven and tolerance for two or three hundred years, presenting opportunities for them. And you find that many of the most famous figures in Mughal history are often people from backgrounds. So, for example, as well as Nur Jahan coming from Persia, Safda Jang, who, whose tomb now occupies a great chunk of Delhi, and whole area of Delhi is, is named after him. He was himself a, a Persian first-generation immigrant. That uh, Mir Jaffa, who plays a very important role at the Battle of Plassey, was in fact from the what was now Iraq, but was then part of Iran. And so you find this long migration of Persian noblemen heading to make their fortune, like sort of Dick Whitting to come to London, the equivalent was to go to Fatipur Sikri. So I, I, mean, I read something quite recently, which, I mean, tell me whether this rings true, but I kind of love it, that Persians, no matter how much money they had in their pockets, they came to India for safe haven, sure, but they always regarded themselves as better. <laughs> like, you know, you might, you might not have two sort of rupees to rub together, but there was a kind of a superiority complex because they were literate, because they knew poetry. They may have known Firdausi. So there, there was always this sense of, you know, they were nobility in rags, just waiting for their fortune to catch up with them. And does that ring true? It does ring true. And, and, and while you do get Indian poets writing in Persian who are read elsewhere, for example, the Delhi poet Bedal is now regarded as one of the great poets in Central Asia, although he's from Delhi and is forgotten here. Nonetheless, there are far more cases of Indians who wrote Persian poetry and thought it was wonderful, but, but very few of them get read outside their own homeland. So Ghalib, for example, the most famous Urdu poet, he thought his greatest achievement was in Persian. Really? Uh, but, but virtually no one today ever reads Ghalib's Persian poetry. No Persians ever heard of Ghalib. No, but Ghalib's Urdu poetry is a thing of great beauty. I mean, late night and any party, you'll exactly. just have somebody doing great stanzas of Ghalib. And, it, and it's quite thrilling when that happens. Now, let's talk about Noor Jahan in particular, because she's born in the winter of 1577. It is not the most auspicious entry into the world because it's on a roadside outside Kandahar, halfway literally through her parents fleeing to Mughal India from Safavid, Persia. So, I mean, that in itself is not the most auspicious way for a future empress of the world to meet the world. And her name wasn't Noor Jahan when she was born. What did her parents choose to call her, the baby by the roadside? She was originally called Mihir Nisa, meaning son of women or, or radiance of women. So, they, they, I mean, they're economic migrants in, in modern terms, but they arrive at a very good moment. Akbar is built this new capital at Fatipur Sikri. It's coming up very, very fast. There are wonderful pictures of, uh, of all the artisans making these beautiful buildings in a sort of Gujarati style. He's just conquered Gujarat, and a lot of Gujarati masons are now seeking work in the capital. And again, one of the surprising things about Mughal India, if you believe the normal stereotypes about Islam and its treatment of women, is that well-born Mughal women received a spectacular education. Most of them were literate. And Noor Jahan was well-versed in Persian literature. She could compose poetry. And this was a period when 
epic poems like like the Shahnameh were, were, were widely performed and widely known. But you also get Indian epics that develop on this fault line between the Hindu world and the Muslim world, like the story of Hamza, uh, which is originally a story of one of the companions of the Prophet, which goes into its own Indian edition, if you like, with thousands of shaggy dog stories being attached to it. And one of the very first masterpieces of Mughal art produced in Fatipur Sikri at the court of Akbar at exactly the period Nur Jahan is growing up is the illustrations of the tale of Hamza and, and Akbar's having them produced on very large pieces of paper to be held up rather like a slideshow at the court in the evening to yeah, illustrate right. the, the stories which the bards are, are, are reciting and, and, and reading out. Well, when you have no telly, these are the things we resort to, which is no bad thing. What, what I love about her upbringing, from, from what I understand of it, is that, you know, whereas in Safavid, Persia, a poet's loving father might be persecuted or, or looked at with suspicion, he finds a place in Fatibur Sikri where it is okay to love poetry and to love art and to look at lovely pictures. And so his home becomes a bit of a Bloomsbury set type setup where all the poets and musicians and artists sort of tend to congregate. So she would have had a really rich hinterland of comings and goings in the house, wouldn't she? Well, the, the court of Akbar was famous for its uh, different stars of, of Tanzan, the great musician, and the legend of the different stars of the court who were entertained by Akbar and, and, and were the glories of his court. And the court of Akbar becomes, for 200 years after this, something that people say, ah, oh, it was like the court of Akbar that day. We had mm. so many bright people doing their stuff, reciting their poetry. And this is a moment of great sort of courtly brilliance that is remembered in India as being a, a moment of sort of civilizational climax. And so Noor is educated at this time, and she has instructions in not just literature, but ethics and morality. And she is clearly from the very beginning, extremely intelligent, energetic, independent, and later on, she becomes politically very savage. She's also athletic. She's famous for in later life for her ability as a marksman and her really? ability to use a musket. Exactly. Uh, the very first English envoy to India, so Thomas Rowe, talks about her, how she can shoot tigers from a hidden howdah and how she was one of the best shots in court. Well, I mean, it sort of, it really flies against what usually was expected of, of girls because, you know, at the time, a guide for raising children had this to say about raising girls, that they should be cultivated in gravity, continence and modesty. I think continence meant, meant something different uh, than it did today. <laughs> but, you know, there, there is this idea that they should be somehow well, I don't know, girdled up, contained somehow, but she certainly doesn't. There are lots of references to her beauty. I mean, apart from her athleticism, about her beauty, the wheatish complexion, as Indians like to put it, to sort of a, a fairer skin, aquiline nose, you know, that kind of thing is poured over when, when spoken about Noor Jahan. I don't know that any of these are any necessarily true. <laughs> authentic. Okay. or true, which Clearly, she was an attractive woman and she managed to completely obsess the emperor. Well, she can't have been ugly. Exactly. Yeah. So, she, so, so th th there must have been some physical element in that. But whether we actually have authentic descriptions of her beauty, I know that later on in my white mogul period, when I'm researching the 18th century, that you have to have female artists to go into the zanana to paint. So there are such things as authentic representations of women, but they would have been done by female artists who were, who were were there, but were obviously less common than male art. And also probably less prized, which is why we don't have so many of them or with the women's names attached. That's really interesting. Can I ask you one thing? I mean, if you are if you are a beauty, and let's just take it that she is beautiful, as you say, she snags an emperor, you know, an emperor becomes obsessed by her. But, you know, the normal proclivity, if you've got a very pretty girl in the house, is to marry her off as quickly as possible. So what what happens to Nur Jahan? At what age does, does that pressure start to build up around this very clever, accomplished, athletic young woman? Well, it was the tradition at this period for women to marry often as young as 14 or 15. And what's fascinating about Nur Jahan is that she has already been married once when uh, she enters Jahangir's life. She marries, first of all, another Persian exile, uh, a military officer called Ali Kuli. How old is she when she marries? She's 17, which would have been, uh, that, by that standard, relatively late. Getting on a bit. Yeah. And he's found gainful employment at the Mughal court. Uh, he was an older man and a fierce soldier. And 
Nur Jahan, marriage to Ali Kuli, produces her only child in 1600 or 1601, a girl named Ludley. Lardley. Did you say Lardley? Lardley. And so do you know Lardley means, I mean, I don't know whether it's a coincidence, but Lardley, certainly in Hindustani or, or common vernacular, means the beloved one, the one who is loved. How lovely. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's like, they will say, oh, Baba ki Lardley, like she's, the, she's beloved of her father. I wonder if that's where it's from. Anyway, sorry, carry on, interruption. Anyway, so in the Mughal court, there was never any tradition that the eldest son would naturally automatically inherit the throne, which means that every single generation, there's a terrific fight for the throne. And one, two or three brothers are killed or imprisoned. There is a terrible tradition in the Mughal court that the defeated brothers get sent to the fort at Gwalior, where they're fed poppy water, which is this uh, way of sort of dulling their senses and basically turning them into opium addicts and they die young. Oh my God, what, just sort of basically getting them strung out on smack and leaving them to die? It was believed to be a relatively benign end yeah. to various other options, such as blindings or... No, okay. Uh, <laughs> right, if, if, they, if that's what's on the menu, sure, okay. <laughs> poppy water or blindings. <laughs> yeah, I, I go for the poppy water. Uh-huh. But this is exactly what happens in the early days of Jahangir's reign. Uh, he comes to power in 1605 when his father, Akbar, dies. And only a year later, in April 1606, Jahangir's son Khusro flees the Agra fort on the pretext of paying a visit to his grandfather's tomb. And he's got about 350 horsemen with him, and they go on the rampage. They loot uh, and they burn, they attack traders, burn caravanserais, and Jahangir moves pretty quickly to put this rebellion down. He's not going to have this snowball into something bigger uh, than it need be. And so he takes his army and goes straight into battle against his son, Khusro. And Khusro is no military leader. Uh, When the battle takes place, he's not at the front of his troops and he is captured pretty quickly. And Khusro is hauled before the emperor uh, in chains with his left foot and his left hand chained together, which is an ancient tradition going right back to the time of Genghis Khan. And even after that happens, there is further ripples of rebellion which follows. And it's in one of these ripples that uh, Nur Jahan, then Mir Nissa's husband, Ali Kuli, is killed. Uh, In 1607, a year after Khusro's rebellion has been crushed, Ali Kuli, the future Nur Jahan, Mir Nissa's husband, is arrested and killed when he tries to resist. He pulls a sword, and there's a variety of different accounts of his death. But what is agreed anyway is that he he dies fighting. He goes down with a sword in his hand. So Amir Nissa's husband is dead. And what happens in the case, not just of rebellion, but often uh, when a leading nobleman dies anyway, not only do his possessions pass back into the hand of the emperor, uh, who in in the kind of political theory of the time owns everything and gives it to his men as an act of generosity. Not only do his goods go back to the emperor, but even the dead man's family, and that includes his wife. So Mira Nisa uh, is sent off to Agra, but first of all, she's allowed 40 days of mourning uh, for her husband. But after that, she is sent off to an entirely new life in the imperial harem in the fort in Agra. We'll take a break at that point. See you after the break. Welcome back. So just before the break, we had young Nur Jahar, who has a daughter called Deary. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Love it so much. Deary, yeah. Uh, so her, her daughter uh, she has, but her husband she no longer has, and she has been co-opted into the harem of Jahangir. I just the mechanics of that. Is that somebody who is on the lookout for, you know, bolstering a harem who sees a good looking woman and says, You'll do, or is it Jahangir lays eyes on her and how do you how do you enter a harem? How, what happens here? I don't know the specific mechanism by which uh, Nur Jahan entered the harem at this point, but there is a whole system of admission. Well, like spotters who see somebody in it, or he'll like her. There's also the, the famous bazaar where women who, who 
want to improve their fortunes and by associating themselves or whose fathers want their own careers enhanced by having a, a daughter potentially in line for the throne are given little stalls outside the no. fort in Agra uh, where, they, the where they're allowed to sell things to the emperor. The idea is to give the emperor a deck of, of the... Uh, of the pretty, pretty girls. Pretty hey, girls. so that's like a beauty pageant, sort of like Miss Zanana, 1604. It that's is exactly really that. odd. Good God. <laughs> Okay, all right. But we, what we need to do is to paint a picture of Jahangir himself because he is another fascinating character, like all the moguls. One of the great joys of mogul history is that not only do we have very finely drawn artistic images of every single emperor, and we know exactly what each one looked like in a way that we don't, for example, of the Delhi Sultans. You can't say what uh, Ibrahim Lodi looked like. There's no picture of him. But we know exactly what Babur, Humayun, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb, each one of them, we know exactly what they look like as boys, as youths, as, as middle-aged men, and old age. And Jahangir, in addition to all this gorgeous portraiture, has a massive diary like Babur, the Tuzuki Jahangiri, and we get a picture of, again, a, a man who totally defies Western stereotypes of what an Islamic ruler is, because he is a man who is enormously curious and intelligent, observant of the world around him, a keen collector of its curiosities. He loves Venetian swords and globes and Safavid silks and jade pebbles and narwhal teeth. You know, those long sort of ivory like uh, and people thought they were unicorn horns for a exactly. while exactly and- he, he loves those and, and in his diary the Tuzuki Jihangiri he talks about them and he takes delight in simple pleasures provided by landscapes which again is something which we don't imagine pre-modern people to do he, he talks about the beauties of countryside the animals flowers and places and, and the personalities which fill them in one memorable passage in the Tuzuk, as he crosses the river Beas on his way to Kabul in 1606, he records his happiness at seeing the pink and red oleander in full bloom, and he orders that his troops wear nosegays of flowers in their helmets so that a wonderful moving flower bed was produced. And he encourages the greatest of all Mughal painters of things botanic and ornithological, uh, Mansur, to paint the individual irises or the or the, the beautiful stalks or whatever it is, or the, the turkey or the dodo, which comes to court as a curiosity. And as well as maintaining the empire and commissioning these great works of art, he takes an active interest in goat and cheetah breeding, medicine and astronomy. He's got an insatiable appetite for things like animal husbandry and the curiosity of the natural world. He wants to know how storks mate and how their chicks are reared. And he's captivated by the antics of monkeys and orangutans or watching black bud gazelles and elephants and he has a long passage in his diary which i love about uh, working out the gestation period of elephants how long they're pregnant for so he's rather like an 18th century gentleman he is a gs but there's another side to him now now again let me let me throw you what sort of popular culture has thrown up what i've grown up with because he wasn't always jahangir you know a master of the world he was prince salim he was born salim and we have, you know, in culture and music, in film in particular, the story of Prince Salim falling in love with a dancing girl called Anarkali. Are you, are you aware of this? No, no, only am I aware of it. I, I researched one of my books in Anarkali's tomb. So tell the story. Because I'm writing about that area right now. So it, so, so it is, I mean, it is a shocking story and it's beautifully done in, in an early Bollywood black and white Half black and white, Mugliar's a beautiful, beautiful film. Half black and white, half colour. There's a film called uh, Anarkali as well. So in this film, Prince Salim, Akbar's son and heir and light of his life, falls in love with a dancing girl called Anarkali, lowborn, and he does not like it. And he tries to break up the relationship time and time again. But Salim is a romantic. He is a new man, a renaissance man. He loves beauty and he loves to love. And so he won't give her up. And so what Akbar does, who you know, otherwise is, is sort of kind of rather fondly remembered by a lot of people. But he does this terrible thing where he, he tells Anarkali, leave my son. And she says, no, I love him. I love him. It's simple. And so he bricks her up alive in this tomb. And so, you know, folklore goes, you can still hear her singing 
because she sings until the last brick is placed in the tomb in front of her. She's bricked up alive. And you've got all these other wonderful love songs in Mugliaza, Muhabbat Kijuti, and this sort of stuff. Well, so is there any truth to the Anarkali story, first of all, with your researching? Did it happen? Was it a thing? We don't know how much is true or not. This is story is first recorded by an English traveller called William Fitch. But there seems to be some basis for it, because when you go to Lahore today, and I've actually worked inside it because it's the, it's the archives uh, of Lahore, and uh, I've researched both Return of a King and Last Mughal in there. It's a wonderful place to work. And on Anarkali's tomb, because there is the little sepulchre which sits on top of the grave, uh, there is this quote that, could I behold the face of my beloved once more, I would thank God until the day of resurrection. So this is erected by Jahangir for this girl whose name we don't know, but is, who in tradition is supposed to be Anarkali. And we don't know the whole story, but it, yes, there is some sort of forbidden romance but I don't think she was walled up alive. Okay. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad for her sake, because that would have been awful. But now we've got this new, beautiful young woman who's had a child, Noor Jahan, who has been far streamed into the harem. Tell us what happens next. So Meronisa is in this enormous harem with all these different women from different parts of India, probably speaking different languages, some of them Tibetan, some of them Kashmiri, some of them Kabuli, uh, some of them from the Deccan, and not all of them by any means are sexually involved with the emperor. Uh, some are there because of treaties or diplomatic alliances. Some are the old grannies, are the, are the, uh, uh, the senior women um, from the old court of Akbar, and they actually rule the roost. They're the ones who are, who are making marriage alliances and so on. So initially, presumably, um, Meronisa is only mid-ranking because she has the prestige of her Persian background. We know that she's good looking. We know that she's intelligent and highly educated. We know that she writes poetry. So she would never have been, you know, one of the junior members of the harem. But over the first three years between 1607 or 1608, when she arrives in Agra and 1611, when she finally gets it together with Jahangir, uh, in that time, she's rising up to the top of the harem. And we are told it's not by any means certain, and Jahangir does not say this in his diary, but the story that's always told is that he meets her at this fancy bazaar, this thing that happens once a year. It's an institution um, introduced by Humayun when the women of the harem and also the wives of the nobles set up stalls like an ordinary bazaar, selling bangles and textiles and God knows what. And the emperor actually goes shopping among them. Um, and they play haggling like fishwives flirting. Uh, and it's a jolly occasion, but clearly this is, a, this is also an opportunity for the emperor to meet the women of the court, who we often won't have any opportunity to see. And it's in March 1611 at Noruz, the new year, uh, that he comes across Maranisa and pretty quickly decides to marry her. And Jahangir bestows on her the name Nur Mahal, or Light of the Palace. And from this moment, his infatuation only seems to grow. So, she, I mean, she must have been pretty something, because, I mean, let's remind people who may not have listened to the Ottoman Empire, but harems were inherently political, dangerous places for women. You had lots of wives, mothers of princes, other princes who may want to stake their claim if an emperor had numerous wives. The intrigue, the sexual exploitation, although you say Jahangir, like his father, was sexually restrained, but you know historically it wasn't really a lovely place for a young girl to be. But to survive all that, to rise through all that, to have somebody notice your qualities like that—I mean, that speaks of quite steely stuff as well. So, I mean, we could assume that Nur Jahan was not just you know book smart, but street smart as well to survive all that. And I think you get the impression that Jahangir, who's clearly an intelligent curious guy finds in Nur Jahan someone who's not just attractive, but who has the qualities that makes him regard her as an equal. And from this point, it becomes one of the great romances of Indian history. Yeah. It's also, though, it's a story of a, a political blossoming for a woman as well. I, mean, I, I think this is really interesting that she spends the first few years of, of her second marriage developing political alliances at court. She knows who's who, who are the right people to know, who are the important people, who you need their support. And that not only enhances her status within the harem, but also just, you know, she gets 
known throughout the realm. She gets known, her name gets put about beyond the walls. I mean, one of the things she does is that she is kind to the poor. It's not just sort of like throwing out bread from the window, but she does things like providing dowries for orphaned girls, which is the difference between life and death for many. But she's also politically astute, and she early on develops an alliance with Prince Karam, who becomes Shah Jahan, uh, Jahangir's son, the future builder of the Taj Mahal. She singles him out as her ally in the next generation, and she makes every effort to fate him. And in turn, he extends her great respect. Because she's nice to him, a good stepmother, yeah. And he has already become betrothed to Miranissa's niece, Arjuman Banu, who will become Mumtaz Mahal. The love of his life. Oh, fantastic. She does this canny thing. I don't know whether it's canny or it's just natural that if you are rising to the top, you take those around you with you. But her family certainly does benefit, doesn't it, yes. from being on the wrong side of history for a while. She manages to rehabilitate them and they, they rise to power as well. What happens to Noor's father? So Noor's father, who becomes known as Itma Dudaro, the pillars of the state, is named chief finance minister. And her brother Asaf Udal, who's buried in Lahore, behind Jahangir's tomb, between, fun enough, the tombs of Noor Jahan and Jahangir, is named as chief steward of the imperial treasury and placed in charge of the mints and all construction projects. So um, she's very savvy and, and clever in bringing in her family. So it isn't just that she is the chief wife, the whole family become the kind of the first family in association with the Mughal dynasty. She's supported. Good, good for her. It's dangerous to be, you know, rising to the top in febrile kingdoms and times of yore. Now, tell me about how, and I, I love this about her, but she manages to make herself an integral part of the weighing of the emperor ceremony. I love this ceremony so much, and you're going to have to explain it because it's just marvellous. It is the only time, I suppose, that um, the common man is hoping for a really fat emperor. Tell, tell us why. Tell us why this works. So I think, and I might be wrong about this, but I think this is originally a Hindu custom. This is not a Mughal custom in origins. And the idea is that you weigh the emperor against jewels and gold. And so the heavier he is, the more stuff there is on the other, the other scale. And it is distributed to the poor and the needy. <laughs> Fat him up. <laughs> I sneak him some toast. Also said yes. that the number of goats equal to the emperor's age are gifted to the farmers. Right. It all sounds marvelous. But but she takes on the key ceremonial duties. That's the point. You know, organizing that means that you are immediately linked to something that is charitable and is a feel good kind of, you know festival of, of giving, which is no shabby thing. Does she become very quickly part of the inner circle as well as sort of being outwardly linked to the throne and good things? Inwardly, does Jahangir talk to her, ask her her opinion? Does she become an advisor of sorts? So she, she clearly does. And we know from the accounts of Sir Thomas Rowe, who's the English ambassador, that she's certainly regarded at court as the eminal scree, as the person who's pulling all the strings. And if you want a diplomatic alliance or you want a job or you want your family preferred, somehow you've got to get to Nur Jahan to get it done. And this becomes even more the case when Jahangir develops increasingly an alcohol problem. And being Jahangir, he doesn't just have this generally in the background. He records it in his diary in enormous detail. And he he leaves a very detailed account of his own addiction. Oh, like what? Like, I mean, what, what's he getting through? What does he admit to? And he says that when he, when he was young, he would just have one cup of sweet wine, uh, but that he records then how he starts getting into double and triple distilled liquors and how he attempts to try and control this. Uh, so he's, he's this sort of very self-aware figure, but it, it definitely becomes more and more of a problem. Self-aware, but very, very pissed. Listen to the intake at one stage in this daily intake diary that he creates. 20 cups of distilled spirit. I mean, that man's liver would have been the size of a canoe. But does it then fall to sort of Noor Jahan to try and control him, wean him off? I mean, does she, what role does she take? So she does try and control it. And there's also a senior royal physician who succeeds in getting him to reduce only to six cups a day. 
uh, and to move to a mixture of two parts wine and one part spirit. But he also has, I think, a fair amount of opium. And he becomes more and more incapacitated. He also has respiratory issues like asthma. And um, as he becomes more incapacitated, Noor Jahan takes over the reins of power. And we see this reflected in a series of coins where uniquely for the Mughals, you have not only Jahangir's image, but also Noor Jahan's. Which is so revolutionary and such a big deal. Do people thank her for stepping in to the breach and helping with ruling? And what, what, how do they react to being run by a woman? So we know from the, again, from the accounts of Thomas Rowe that her power is known and presumably resented because people, unless they have access to Nur Jahan, they can't get their, their work done. So it's not a secret. It, it, it's widely known in court that this woman is not just now the wife, the love and the obsession of Jahangir, but is the woman who is actually ruling the state increasingly. And then in 1615, at this point when Jahangir's diary is full of all these incredible compliments about his amazing young wife, her name is changed and she becomes Noor Jahan, the light of the world. Well, you know what? It's a good place to stop because I think in the next episode, we're going to talk about what she does, this amazing woman, Noor Jahan, who is now in the position of empress of one of the most uh, impressive empires of the day. What does she do with all that newfound power? How do people tolerate it, take it? If you want to hear it right now and you can't wait, then just join our club. Just go to our club. A special member perk is that you get these little mini series straight off. So do do that. And if not, join us next time. Until then, it's goodbye from me, Anita Arnand. And goodbye from me, William Durimple. Sherlock, where are you going? Grab your microphone now. Where are you? We are going to Dartmoor. Hello, please, what's your emergency? I found a, I found a body on Dartmoor. Early reports from Dartmoor coming to us now regarding a potential murder inquiry. Some very sad news now regarding the horse trainer, June Straker. Um, this was the home of June Straker. Devastating news. June was an exceptional trainer. But the biggest question now person. is where is Silver Blaze? Silver Blaze. Where is Silver Blaze? I want to know how a multi-million pound racehorse can go missing. That's what the I empty do. stable of Silver Blaze. You've got a Grand National favourite, overwhelming favourite, week before the Grand National goes missing and a trainer gets killed. That statement there from Colonel Racing Stables urging calm, urging respect. But you're During saying that the disappearance of Silver Blaze is political? No, 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 Robert, I'm absolutely not saying Racing that. horses full stop is inhumane. A little explainer, maybe, uh, for our international listeners. Uh, Silver Blaze is a very successful British racehorse. June Straker and Silver Blaze is an example of animal rights activism to the absolute extreme. That is such nonsense, Ian. How is that nonsense? That is is nonsense. The horse is missing and a woman is dead. It's gambling money at the arse of it and it's the companies that have the blood on their hands. What really... It's a sick, twisted industry with sick, twisted... Go and look in a racing yard and see how horses are looked after. Animal rights activists in England have to... Excuse me. Right, honourable member for Darwin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Our hearts are broken. Straker was found dead on the moors. Our community is wounded. Justice for Silver Blaze! But the people of Dartmoor will not give up our search for Silver Blaze. Racing stakeholders believe the sport is at a critical juncture. We're going to find first Prime Minister's backbone, our Silver Blaze. <laughs> Silver Blaze. 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 Sherlock, are you trying to draw my attention to something? Yes. To the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. Sherlock and Co. The adventure of Silver Blaze begins 9th of April. Search Sherlock & Co. wherever you get your podcasts.